great, great message. We must turn from our sin to, in, to repentance. And can I tell you, just don't grab one of these. Grab about five of them. And, w- and when you go somewhere, just take one and put it down somewhere. Like if you go to a dentist's office or something like that, just put it on the table. You know, if you go to a, a laundromat or something, you just leave it on, you know, where all the magazines are, just leave it there. You, it has a salvation message on it, and it's a, it's a great little way of witnessing uh, the herald of his coming. been getting this for over 35 years. Just help yourself back there. They're free of charge. Amen. So I'll put this over here. Okay, where's my water? All right. Tonight is lesson 15. You all have your books, right? Okay. Um, We're going to be talking about the breach principle, the breach, B-R-E-A-C-H principle. And what is the breach principle of biblical interpretation? We're going to be talking about that tonight um, because it's very important that when you interpret Scripture that you interpret it properly. And um, how many are enjoying the Bible study so far? Amen? You're getting something out of it? Good. Only half of the, this half of the room raised their hand. Nobody on this side raised their hand. Maybe if you sit on this side, you'll enjoy it more. I'm only kidding. Praise the Lord. Well, the breach principle of biblical interpretation is the principle by which a certain verse or passage of Scripture is aided by a consideration of certain breaches. Now, either breaches of promise or breaches of time. So if you have a Scripture, uh, if you have this Scripture up there, please, Numbers 14, verse 34. Numbers 14, verse 34. And when he, once he gets it up there, we'll read it. Amen. After the number of days in which you search the land, even 40 days, each day for a year, shall be, so you bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and you shall know my breach of promise. When you, when you read something like this, sometimes you scratch your head and you say, well, what is he talking about? What's, what's going on, you know? Um, what's a breach of promise? So in the definition of this principle, there are two elements, breaches of promise and breaches of time. And we'll look at both of these separately a little bit later on. <clears throat> but what are some of the words that will help us to understand the concept of a breach? Uh, there are some words that will help us, and uh, they're in the English dictionary if you take them from uh, whatever dictionary you want to use, Webster's, Funk and Wagner, so forth and so on. So the word breach can mean the act of breaking infraction or infringement, a violation of duty, right or legal obligation, a gap or a break as in a wall, like a dike. You know, when they say there's a breach in the, in the, in the wall, or a rupture or amicable relations, relations. In other words, use is a gap, a break in continuity, uh, an interruption, a period of in chronology are a range of phenomena about which nothing is known. Then there's what's called the interruption. An interruption is to cause a delay or a break-in or to break the continuity. A delay to put off or, uh, for a future time, postpone or to defer, uh, a temporary stoppage or stay. <clears throat> Excuse me. An interval. Interval is open space between two objects, distance between points. An intermission, temporary cessation, an interruption, a hiatus, a gap or opening break with a pot missing, or a pause, a temporary cessation of action or speech, a calculated measure of silence. You see that when you read the Psalms. You ever, ever want, come up across the Psalm and you see the word sila? That's what the word sila means. It means pause and think about it. That's exactly what it means. So when you read a psalm and it says Selah, he's not talking to someone. He's just giving you a a Hebrew word there that means to stop. Don't read any further. Just contemplate what you've already read. Amen? Now, how can we illustrate this general principle from the Bible? 
Well, let's look at for a moment, <clears throat> and we'll see it in 2 Samuel 6 8, because the breach of Uzziah is a good illustration of this principle. 2 Samuel uh, chapter 6, verse 8. And it says, And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzziah, a Uzza, rather, I'm sorry. And he called the name of the place Perazua to this day. The Lord had made a breach. So you have to, you have to kind of understand what that's talking about. So let's look at this in, in the light of 2 Samuel chapter 6 and, and the purpose that was uh, attempted, okay? In 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 to 2, we're going to go to 1 to 2. It says, shortly after David took authority as king over all of Israel, I'm sorry, that's not, that's, is that it? Again, uh, wait a minute, 2 Samuel 6, 1 and 2. Again, David gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal to Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. So here David had a purpose. He was attempting to bring the ark back into Israel's um, uh, the word I'm trying to find, uh, possession, okay? And if we look at Second Chronicles, chapter 13, verse 1 to 4. <clears throat> now, in the 18th year of King Jeroboam began Abijah to reign over Judah. He reigned three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Micaiah, the daughter of Ural of Gibeah. And there was war between Abijah and Jeroboam. And Abijah set the battle in array with an army of valiant men of war, even 400,000 chosen men. Jeroboam also set the battle in array against him with 800,000. Wow, that's a lot. Chosen men being mighty men of valor. Let me see, I got the right one here. Yep, Second Chronicles 13, 1 to 4. Okay. And Abijah stood up upon Mount Zerubim, which is in the Mount uh, Ephraim, and said, Hear me, thou Jeroboam, and all Israel. Shortly after David took authority as king over the tribes of Israel, he consulted with his leaders concerning bringing the Ark of the Covenant from obscurity to the city of David. Now, I want to I mention something to you. It has been known traditionally for centuries that where the Dome of the Rock is, you know, the Muslim Golden Dome in Jerusalem, that that is the Mount Zion, that that is where the Temple uh, of Solomon and, and Herod was. It's been that way for tradition, for tradition for years. But there's new uh, discoveries uh, new ways of analyzing uh, information. And they are finding that there's another place where the temple should be built. I don't know. How many are aware of that? One. Okay. Two. Do you know where it is? You just re read it? Well, look what I just read to you. After they consulted, the Ark of the Covenant was in obscurity to the city of David. Now, the city of David is just outside the wall of Jerusalem. And the city of David is believed today to be where the temple of Solomon and Herod were, was. And the way that they explain it, I can't go into the, the detail right now, but to me, I believe that. I don't believe that the Wailing Wall is part of the original temple. I believe that was part of the Roman um, citadel that they had, um, but um, I don't believe it was where the temple was built. So that means that where the city of David is, 
Okay, because it had to be by the by the uh, spring of Gil. Uh, what was it, Bob? I forgot what the name of that was. But by the spring, um, I can't remember the name. I wish I could remember the name. But anyway, it, that's the only place where there's a spring in Israel, right in that spot, because they needed running water to wash all of the uh, sacrifices and everything. So it's right by the city of David. So anyway. So that's great, interesting. If you go on, on Google and type in the third temple, where should it be built, you'll find out that information. And very, very interesting. And that means, okay, that there's nothing that can prevent them. The Muslims can't prevent them. They can build a third temple. So that's interesting. And here it says, he brought the Ark of the Covenant from obscurity to the city of David. Now, right there is the threshing floor of Onan. Okay, and that's where Solomon built the temple on the threshing floor. If you go up to Mount Moriah where the Dome of the Rock is and you look at that rock, there's no way that could be a threshing floor. It's too uneven. There's no way that that could be done there. So there's some, some good parts and some good things about that. So um, let's look at uh, this again. First uh, Chronicles 13. First Chronicles 13. Verses 3 to 4. Bless you. Okay. It says, And let us bring again the ark of our God to us, for we inquired not as at it in the days of Saul. And all of the congregation said that they would do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. So they had a purpose. They had, they had a purpose of doing something. <clears throat> now, was it God's will for that ark to come back into the... Uh, Possession of the Israelites, uh, the, uh, the, the Jews? Yes, it was. God wanted that. That's what God had promised. That's what God had, had manifested himself, if you will, to them. So now we saw the purpose attempted. Let's look at the purpose that was breached. Okay. David and his uh, designated leaders assembled 30,000 people, and they went to get the ark from the house of Abinadab, and they put it on a new cart. Okay, driven by user and Ohio, and they proceeded on to Jerusalem. While en route, the oxen stumbled, and user reached out his hand, you know the story, to try to steady the ark, and as soon as he touched the ark, he was struck dead. Okay. Now, here's the purpose of something they were doing good. They were bringing that ark back into Israel's possession, Right? They were reestablishing the, the covenant with God. They were uh, you know, going to do the sacrifices, and they were going to have the manifestation of God's presence. So everything was good. The only problem was they didn't do it correctly. They didn't do it right. So there was a breach. Okay? There was a delay. And we see that the breach ended up producing a delay, a temporary stoppage or a break in the continuity and the interruption in the plan of David. When we don't do things correctly, when we don't do things right, it can cause a breach in anything and everything that God promises. If we try to do it our way or we try to, you know, compromise and do it the way we think we should do it, and God says, no, do it this way, and we refuse and do it our own way, that can cause a breach in the promise of being fulfilled in your life, just like it was here. And you know the story. I'm going to kind of just kind of um, give it to you real quick. Um, <coughs> when Yusa touched that ark, and he, 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 got, he got killed for it, why do you think God killed him? Speak it out. Come on, yell it out. What, Annie? Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Okay, let's look at Numbers chapter 4, verse 15. Numbers 4, verse 15. And when Aaron and his sons have made an end of 
covering the sanctuary and all the vessels of the sanctuary as the camp is to set, is to set forward. After that, the sons of Kor, Korhath shall come to bear it, meaning the ark, but they shall not touch any holy thing lest they die. God could not go back on his word. If he would have gone back on his word, then he would have been a liar. God said here, no one is to touch the holy things lest they die. God decreed that word, that prophetic word. He decreed it, and he spoke it out, and he said, if anyone touches those things, they'll die. So what happens? Yusa had a good intention. He wasn't just doing it just to touch. You know, like if you saw a, a bench that was painted, you know, and it says, wet paint, don't touch. And you know how, how we are, right? We're going to go over to that bench. And we're going to see if it's dry. We're going to kind of touch it, you know what I mean, to see if it's dry. Okay? No, he didn't do it with that intention. He did it with a good intention. He didn't want to see the ark fall over. But even with good intentions, first and foremost, David made an, a terrible mistake. What he did was, he began to copy what the Philistines did. The Philistines that captured the ark put it in a cot and drove it around. And then all of a sudden they started getting all kinds of sicknesses and diseases. And they said, well, hey, we better get rid of this thing because this thing is cursing us. Okay, So they put it on a cot and they, they sent it away. Well, when David got it, right, when David got, saw the ark coming and he saw it on the cot, right, he didn't put it on the Philistines' cot. It says he put it on a new cot, okay? Just because people do things and copy things from the world doesn't make it right. And can I tell you, that's what the church has done today. They've tried to copy the world, make the churches look like a nightclub now, Come on now, somebody. You can't do that. Just like you can't do it in those days, you can't do it today. You can't say to God, well, we're going to do it this way. And, and No. So God already decreed it that anyone that touches those holy things will die. It's already done deal. A, even though his intention was good, he touched it and he died. Amen? So what, did that, so what did that cause? That caused a delay in the purpose that David had intended. And can I tell you, when we do things our way and we don't do things God's way, there's going to be a delay. Okay? And it's not that God didn't want that to happen, okay, uh, as far as God, you know, Israelites having the Ark of the Covenant. No, he wanted to be among his people. That's how he dwelt among his people at one time. But because David didn't go by the Levitical priests and the instructions of carrying the ark on poles on their shoulders, but put it on a cot, he compromised God's word. He compromised the things that God was instruction in his instruction. They compromised that. God says, no, I, you're not supposed to carry it. So really, the whole fault wasn't on God. The whole fault was on David. Because David didn't do it properly. Okay? So now what happens? David gets so discouraged. Okay? He's defeated. Now he knows his sin. He knows what he's, what he's done is wrong. Okay? So he sends the ark in Obed-Edom's house. There's a delay. There's a breach in the purpose. And sometimes there's a breach in our purposes when we don't do it the way God wants to do it. So you need to examine things that you're going through in your life and say, God, have I caused a breach, a temporary halt, okay, a gap in what you want to do in my life, and how do I, what do I need to do to get it right? So David, being discovered, he took the ark and he put it in Obed-Edom's house, right? Now, I wonder how he put it in the house. I don't think anybody touched it. <laughs> okay. The scripture doesn't say anybody else died. Okay. 
So they must have put the poles in the holes, lifted it up, carried it on their shoulders, and dropped it off in Obed-Edom's house and lowered it down wherever they put it. I don't know where they put it, but wherever they put it, okay? And then something happened. In those three months, okay, Obed-Edom and his family and his livestock and his possessions all increased. God blessed Obed-Edom. Why? Because he honored God's presence, which is what the Ark of the Covenant represents. He honored God's presence. And so he was blessed. Now, David gets word of this, okay? Because now, you got to understand, David just had experienced three months earlier God's judgment. Think about that. And so it took three months, and David finally had it back in his heart that he wanted to bring the Ark of the Covenant back. So he went to Obed-Edom's house, and we see the purpose accomplished. He goes back, he does it God's way. And what happens? He brings it back to the city of David. And he brings back that Ark. Praise God. Hallelujah. And as that ark is coming down, hallelujah. You know, there's a song we used to sing. It's coming, hallelujah. The ark is coming down the road. Why, was it, why were they rejoicing? Why were they happy? Because, understand, the presence of God was now coming back to the city of David. Hallelujah. Amen. So that's one of the ways of, the, of showing that there was a breach uh, or a purpose attempted. The purpose was breached, and the purpose was accomplished. Amen? So you see how to do that in Scripture? Find out what was the promise. Why was there a delay? So let me, let me just ask you this. Now, that's Old Testament, okay? Now, do you think in the light of the grace and the light of Jesus and his love and his mercy and grace and forgiveness... That that could be done in the New Testament? How many believe it can be done in the New Testament? A breach. Find me one in the New Testament. Find me one. That's your assignment. Find me one. I'm going to tell you one, but you've got to find me one. Okay? And the one I'm going to show you, or the one I'm going to explain to you is Ananias and Sapphira. Okay. Ananias and Sapphira, they had a purpose. And their purpose was to sell the land and the things that they had and bring the money to the apostles' feet. Okay. Now the wife and husband were separated. The husband came in, and he only gave a partial of that. So the purpose was breached. Okay. What happened to him? See, when you make a pledge or you make or you give your tithe, which and excuse me, let me rephrase that. It's not your tithe, it's the tithe. When you bring the tithe that belongs to God to his house, and God begins to bless you, and then you retract that and you start keeping it for yourself. Okay, there's gonna be a breach in your life. Okay. And the purpose is going to be breached. Amen. And things are going to start going wrong. That's just the way it is. You can believe that if you want to. You don't have to. That's up to you. But that does happen. And I can share with you stories, personal stories that I have, that I've seen people that have done that, that have stopped giving God his tithe, and they've robbed God, and they lost everything. Amen. And then David now declares the reason for the breach or stoppage. First Chronicles 15, <clears throat> verse 12 to 15. See, when you, when you look at Scripture, just don't look at it as, uh, you know, a chapter, a verse. There's so much more to it. 
that you can learn from and, and these principles you can learn from of how to interpret the scriptures. Because sometimes it, you'll read something and you'll say, well, okay, that wasn't done, and then you won't read the other part of it, that it was restored. 1 Chronicles 15, verse 12. <clears throat> and said unto them, you are the chief of the fathers of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, both you and your brethren, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel into the place that I have prepared for it. For because you did it not at the first, the Lord our God made a breach upon us, a temporary halt. For that we sought for that we sought him not after the due order. God does things in order. See, he says, go back to that, the scripture before that. Because you did not at the first, the Lord our God, make a breach upon us for that we sought him not. They didn't seek God. They made their own decisions they went their own way. They didn't, in, they didn't even bother to ask what God thought about a situation. And when you make it that kind of a decision, there's going to be a breach. Hello. And look what he says. For the Lord our God made a breach upon us, a halt, an interval, a pause, The purpose was breached. For that we sought him not after the due order. You've got to do things in order. See, the scripture, same way when you're interpreting scripture, it's done in order. You can't do it out of order because then you get the scripture saying all kinds of different things that doesn't mean what, it's, what some people think it means. They have no ability to discern the scriptures. Next verse. <clears throat> so the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. Next verse, please. And the children of the Levites bear the ark upon their shoulders with the staffs that are upon it, as Moses commanded according to the word of the Lord. Now, everything was, when they started to do what was right. Notice that God didn't start to bless them again until they started doing it right. Amen? The moment they started doing it right and they said to God, you know, we, we're sorry, and they sanctified themselves. They weren't just coming in and taking the ark. Okay, let's go take the ark. No. So they sanctified themselves first. The interlude or the breach in the original plan lasted for those three months. After David adjusted his plan to align with the ordinance of the Lord, he experienced full success. Think about that. Just think about it as Christians. How would you feel if for three months you didn't feel the presence of the Lord? You didn't sense his presence, you didn't sense his love, didn't sense his grace, his caring, his forgiveness. But yet some people don't care. You know, I'm reminded of Samson when he didn't realize that the presence of the Lord had departed from him. And how deceptive that is, that we can get to that point in our lives where we don't even realize that the presence of God has departed from us. Okay, let's look at for a moment some places in the scripture where we see the breach of promise in operation. Breach of promise is defined in the dictionary as a failure to fulfill a promise, especially a promise in marriage or etc. The following illustrations are drawn from the text interpreting the scriptures which you have in your, in your laps. Hopefully you have this syllabus with you. As we look at the idea of the breach of promise as it relates to God, we must keep in mind that God is a covenant-keeping God. Amen? He's a covenant-keeping God who is faithful 
to his promises. Look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13 to 20. We're going to read that. For when God made promises to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. <clears throat> Next verse, please. Saying, surely blessing, I will bless thee and multiply thee, I will multiply thee. And so afar, so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Next verse. For men verily swear by the greater, and oath for the confirmation is to them at an end of all strife. Next verse, please. Wherein God willing more abundantly, say more abundantly, to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. <clears throat> Do you hear me? It is impossible for God to lie. So when God says, I love you with an everlasting love, you don't need to doubt that for one moment because he's not telling you a lie. You may have had people in your life tell you that they loved you and turned their back on you and did all kinds of things to you, but that's not God. Hallelujah. God is immutable, and he says that I will, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I love you with an everlasting love, an eternal love, and he will love you all the way. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Which hope we have as an anchor. Did I read the other one before? Go back to the other one. I don't know if I read that one. I didn't finish it. Is it possible for God to lie? We might have a what? Strong consolation. Who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. Next verse. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast, and which endureth into that within the veil. One more, one more verse. Where, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He entered it for us once for all. Now, can that promise be breached? Yes. You and I can walk away from the things of God. We can, we can turn our back on the presence of God. We can go our own way and do our own thing. But, you know, that's, that's like carrying two sticks of dynamite in one pocket. And in the other pocket, you're having a magnifying glass right on the fuse as you're walking on a sunny day. That's kind of dangerous if you ask me. <laughs> I wouldn't want to do that. Come on, somebody. The breach concerning entering the promised land. Look at Numbers 13, 34. It must be kept in mind. Let me just regress for a moment. It must be kept in mind that whatever breaches exist relative to his, relative to his promises, they are all caused by unbelief, disobedience, and failure on the part of us. Not on God. Okay. The breach concerning entering the promised land. Look at Numbers 13.34. Do I have it wrong here? Hmm. Let me see. How wow. That's a misprint. Yeah. Okay, we'll skip that one. 14, yeah, because I got it. Uh, 1434, I'm sorry. Let's look at that one. 
After the number of days in which you search the land, even forty days, each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities, even forty years, and you shall know my breach of promise. Now we read in the scripture, it says that the promises of God are yea and amen, right? That's true. However, the promise can be breached. Amen. They can be breached. And the number of days in which you shall will search the land, even 40 days, each day for a year, shall you bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and you shall know my breach of promise. Anybody know what this is in reference to? When the children of Israel went to spy out the land. Right, where God says, I'm sending you to a land that's flowing with milk and honey. Jo Joshua, yeah. Yeah. There were only two that came with a good report, and the rest came with a bad report. And because they were fearful, the Bible says, they were fearful, and they said, we can't take that for their, the, 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 the people there are, are giants. They're, they're bigger than us. We can't overtake them. What was God's response? See, there was a breach in the promise. They had to wait now. What did they have to wait for? That's right, for that generation to die off because of their unbelief. He had to wait for that generation to die off, right? In fact, he actually wanted to start a whole new nation out of Moses. But Moses interceded and said, God, no, please, you know, lest the Egyptians come and say, see, those people, they couldn't even, they couldn't even be delivered by their God. You know, they couldn't even serve their God. So God had, he changed his mind. He didn't destroy them and, and make a new people out from Moses on. Okay, so here you see that, okay, that God, there was a breach in the, in the promise that God said because they were fearful. They allowed fear in their life. And they allowed fear to stop them from obtaining the promise of God. Now, God may speak to you or might want to speak through you with a tongue and interpretation. And if you sit there and you, and you just fight it, God could have a promise for this church. He could have a word for this church. And there's, an interpret there's, a, there's a tongue, but there's no interpretation. And somebody's got that interpretation, and they're holding back. You understand that you could hold the key to revival. You could hold the key to the heavens being open. You say, me? That's right, you. That one word that God would give you. I was, watch I was watching a testimony of a doctor <clears throat> There was a man who came into the, into the hospital, true story, came into the hospital, I saw it on uh, CBN. He, and you know how they have those stories? He came into the hospital, and by the time he got to the desk, he fell down, he had a massive heart attack, and he died. And they put him on the, they rushed him right into the ER, and they were working on him. They used the paddles five, five, I think five times. He wasn't resuscitated. The doc, one of the doctors came in, examined him, tried to paddle him again, nothing would happen. So he pronounced him dead. I think it was 1130, something like that. So as this doctor's walking out, you know, he, they're cleaning up the body, getting ready for the morgue. As he's walking out the door, now he was a Christian, okay? The Lord spoke to him and said, I want you to go back and I want you to pray for him. And he says, man, I fought that. I fought that. He said, I, I can't do that. I, you know, I, I got my schedule. I got patience to see. I, I, you know, he started to try and to reason with God. You ever tried doing that? How many of you have ever done that? God tells you to do something, you try to reason it out, okay? So he it just wouldn't let him go, and he says, no, I want you to go back and pray for him. He said, but Lord, he's dead. He said, just go back and pray for him. So he goes back, and he goes up to the body, and there's a nurse cleaning, and he, he says, just hold on a minute. He puts his hands on him, and he prays. He says a simple prayer. And then he takes his hands off and he says to one of the other doctors, he says, doctor, he says, hit him one more time with the paddles. Doctor says, but doctor, he's dead. 
He's been dead for 45 minutes. He says, hit him again. And he says, out of respect for me, the doctor did it. He says, in the moment they put the paddles on him and that electricity went through his body, a breath came into him and he began to breathe. When you get the word of God and you got a promise, you don't know what that's going to do. Can you imagine if this doctor just walked away, that guy would have been dead. And come to find out, the guy, now he may have been clinically dead, but he could have been in a state of something. I don't know what. Because the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die after that judgment. So uh, maybe clinically they thought he was dead, but, you know, we don't know that. But all I know is that he wasn't saved. And when he came out of that, okay, when he came out of that, the doctor, after like about a, a week or so, he was in the hospital recovering. The doctor went to see him, and he says, tell me, where did you go? Listen to this now. He said, I was in the darkest place and I never felt such loneliness in my life. I tell you, that's a little bit about what like hell's like. Have you ever felt lonely? I mean, extremely lonely. My point is this: when God says to do it, don't argue with God. Do it. Man, if it's crazy or if it's not God, we'll, we'll, we'll just straighten it out. No big deal. Okay? We only know in part, right? We prophesy in part. We know in part, the Bible says. But we look through a glass darkly. But you know what? I don't want to miss God. So we saw that the land was promised in Genesis and Exodus and Psalms and Deuteronomy. God promised the land to Israel, didn't he? God had promised the land to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the descendants. God spoken in Deuteronomy, uh, we're not going to go there, but he said, he said this in Deuteronomy 1, 6 to 8. See, I have set a land before you, go in. See, that wasn't God's suggestion. That wasn't God telling them, you know, ah, maybe you should think about it. No. He said, go in. Go in and take it. I'm with you. My hope, I'm with you. My spirit's with you. You're going to defeat them. I'm going to defeat them for you. Go in. But instead of believing God, they went by what they saw. Don't go by what you see. Go by what he says. And then we see, we saw the land promise. Now you see man's failure. Because the spies that went into the land focused on the size of the giants rather than the power of their God, who delivered them from the Egyptians, remember, they gave a bad report that robbed the people of faith. You can rob people of their faith. I don't believe in baptism in the Holy Spirit. I don't believe in healing anymore. I don't believe in laying on hands anymore. I don't believe... You're robbing somebody of their faith. Just because you don't want to believe God for that. I can tell you time and time again, Linda and I can tell you, give you testimony, time when sickness tried to come on us. Now, sometimes we get sick. I'm not saying we don't. But there was times when we felt it was an attack of the enemy, right? And we bound that thing and we prayed, and guess what? That thing left. Anyone ever, anyone ever experienced that? Okay, good. I know that immediately when I get a headache and it comes on instantly, instantly, I'm not talking about gradually, I'm talking about instantly comes on, I've been told and taught that it's a sign of demonic presence. And I bind that spirit in the name of Jesus, guess what, that headache goes away. Do you understand we don't only live in a material world, we live in a spiritual world? We don't see the spiritual world. And if we did, we'd probably be scared to death. If you saw how many demons were following you around every day trying to trip you up. Hello? Come on, you know what I'm talking about. And 
And in Numbers, we see this. It says, but the men who had gone up had said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. How do they know that? Don't even went by the outward appearance. I remember Lou Holtz. He was the um, football coach for the um, uh, Notre Dame. And he, he made this statement. He said, it's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. Okay? I saw this uh, video on, on, I don't know if it was Facebook or whatever. It had this little tiny dog, like a chihuahua, a little, little small thing. And it was two lions. And that dog, man, and those, those lions went, they backed up on that little dog. I mean, he would bite at their neck and everything, you know what I mean? He'd jump up on their neck and bite them. They would run, they ran from him. It's not the size of the dog in the fight. See, that's, they saw the size of those men and said, oh, man, we can't do this. No, on your own you can't do that, but guess what? With God you can. Praise the Lord. How much time I got? Not much. And we discuss how God's breach of promise, because of their unbelief, God wanted to kill them. But then after all of that said and done, according to the number of days in which you were uh, You'll be in, in rege- and you'll be in um, bondage. You know, you, you won't go into the promised land for every year. For, for every day that you went, you, you went out to spy the land for every year, 40, you went 40 days, meant 40 years they were going to have to spend in the wilderness. You know what the number 40 means? It's the number of probation. Number of probation. Look at uh, Numbers 14, verse 34, and the Amplified. Can you put the Amplified up there? Numbers 14, 34, and Amplified. Look at this. After the number of days in which you spied out the land of Canaan, even 40 days, for each day a year shall you bear and suffer for your iniquities, even for 40 years, and you shall know my displeasure, the revoking of my promise and my estrangement. Wow. Now, was that the end of it all? No, but after that 40 years, guess what? The promise fulfilled. Joshua, chapter 3, verse 17. The next generation responded to the Lord's challenge to go and successfully enter the land under the leadership of Joshua. Then the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. And you see that there was, once they were in the land, there was a, a the breach concerning dominion in the land. Dominion was promised, right? Go in and possess, right? Go in and take it. Possess the land. Okay? Then something happened. They went in, they possessed the land, right? They were there for a while. But then in Joshua chapter 9, or Judges chapter 2, uh, let me see. Judge, you, can, you can write these down if you want. Joshua 9, 14 to 15. Uh, chapter 15, verse 63. Chapter 16, verse 10. I don't have time to read them. That's why I'm going by them. Uh, 17. Verses 12 to 13. And I'm just going to look up this one for real quick. You might want to look at this one. Come on. My, my finger, my finger, my finger. My fingerprints are gone from the golf ball days. It's hard to grip paper. Come on. There's 
you want to open. Okay, let's see. Okay, no, that's not the one. Okay, but let me read it to you, okay? Upon the death of Joshua, I'll, I'll give you a paraphrase. <clears throat> the Bible says a new generation arose who knew not the forefathers. And as a result, they were oppressed by the other nations. Remember when he told them, you go in, you wipe out all the nations. But some of the nations were left. And that was part of God's plan for testing. The, I wrote something on Facebook. If you can go on there sometime and you can look at about, I did a little study on judges today. Something similar to that. How a new generation rose up that didn't know God and they, they forsook the forefathers. <clears throat> and that's what happened. So you see man's failure again. Uh, Judges 2, 10 to 15 is the one. When all the generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for, the Lord, for Israel. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt and they followed after the other gods among the gods of the people. In other words, they started following the culture of the people. And I tell you, that's exactly what the churches are doing today. They're following the culture of the people. And so it's going to bring a breach in God's promise. Okay. Okay, look at this. In... Um I think it's in Deuteronomy 28, I think. It says, And it shall be that just as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and multiply you. Look at this. So the Lord, yeah, this is Deuteronomy 20, 28, 63 to 68. And it shall be that just as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and bring you to nothing. Wow. Wow. And you shall be plucked up from off the land which you go to possess. Then the Lord will scatter you among all the people. That, they, that happened. That came to pass. That came through the Babylonian captivity. Hello? Through the Romans? Come on, somebody. So what's the end result? Under Ezra and Nehemiah, a remnant returned to the land. You see how the breach, there was a breach, and then God, there was a correction time, and then through that correction time, and now the end result, the promise fulfilled. Under Ezra and Nehemiah, a remnant returned to the land. Even though they were under the dominion of other world powers, they had a certain amount of autonomy. And the most important thing is that as a nation, they were cured from idolatry. You don't see Jews worshiping idols anymore. They finally got that. Okay. And after the temple was rebuilt, there is no evidence that the Jews in Palestine ever practiced idolatry again. It's important to understand the, the distinction between the breaches of promise and the breach of time. That sometimes there's a breach in time, like I was saying, because of our disobedience. God wants to do something. Okay, okay let, me, let, me, let me give you an example. <clears throat> How many believe that the Lord our God is a healer? Right? The Bible says the Lord our God who healeth thee, right? He's Jehovah. Jireh, he's our provider. He's the one that heals us. Okay. So you come down the aisle and you find out, you know, from the doctor you have cancer. Okay. And, and he said, and the doctor tells you, but we caught it in time. 
Okay? So you don't need chemo. You don't need anything. What you need to do is stop smoking. Okay? So you come down the aisle and you pray you know, for God to help you stop smoking, okay? And, and, and you, you throw your cigarette pack down on the altar. Then you go back and you go in your car and you open up the glove box, get another pack of cigarettes, start smoking again. So there's a breach now you're, you're causing by your disobedience. And if you don't listen to authority, guess what happens? You get cancer and you die. And you cry out to God for healing and you cry out for God to healing and guess what? He doesn't heal you because there's a breach. I'm going to end this with a story that I, I can tell you of, a personal story that's true. <clears throat> we were in a Friday night service one night. It was a family, family night over someone's house. We used to have Friday night fellowship. You were there too, Linda, I think, right? And after the fellowship, you know, being in an Italian home, you have all kinds of snacks and coffee and all kinds of good stuff, okay? Um, and... Um, we were sitting there having fellowship, and, and the Lord spoke to me and told me, I said, God wants you to hear, my, hear his voice. And I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember exactly the words, but something on this idea. He wants, you, he wants you to stop smoking. Now, two of them, one was my mother-in-law, Linda's mom. The other one was a sister in the Lord, and then we were at her house with her husband. And I told them, I says, because if you don't stop, you're going to get cancer. Well, that night, that was the last time her mother ever smoked. She never smoked again. She listened. The other one didn't. The other one died at 54 years old of cancer. Oh, we prayed. The daughter prayed and fasted. The father fasted, prayed. Too late. Why didn't they resurrect user? Hello? Why do we think we have the power to outdo what God says? What makes us think that we can outdo God? What makes us think that we don't have to listen to God? And then when we get in trouble, hello? You don't have to, you don't have to cause that breach to receive the promise of God. You don't have to get in the way of God by being disobedient. Just be obedient. Oh, pastor, you don't know how hard it is. Excuse me, okay? You have the willpower to do it, right? We have the same willpower to not do it. It's called free will. The same power that you have to not do what you know to do is what's right. You have the same power to do what's right. <laughs> Come on. I don't have time to go into the last one, so that's okay. You can read it in your book. So how is the... The, I'm going to close with this. How is the breach or gap principle to be applied? These following five points, okay? Number one, determine whether the verse of passage under consideration is in any way related to a breach. Number two, if a breach is intimated, discern the true nature of the breach as well as its cause and its boundaries. Three, make a distinction between a breach of promise and a breach of time. Remember that breaches of promise are caused by unbelief, while breaches of time are the result of the prophets viewing separate events as one. You know, and I'll give you an example of that real quick, is in Daniel, when uh, Antiochus, it was prophesied that uh, Antiochus Epiphanes would come, a man would come and defile the temple. Well, that happened in A.D. 70, I believe it was, or around there, where Antiochus Epiphanes went into the temple and defied the temple. Okay. But there's also a future Antiochus Epiphanes, who's the Antichrist, who's going to come in the third temple. Okay, so it is a twofold purpose there. Due to the limited uh, relevance of this principle, 
To most passages of scripture, the interpreter must not apply it unless the context demands it. Don't try to put a, a breach where it's, when it's not there. And this principle must be used in harmony with all of the other principles that we're learning. Amen? Praise the Lord. Did you learn something? All right, good. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for tonight, Lord, trying to help us to understand that we can, we can know how to interpret the scriptures correctly and what principles to use and which way to look at things in the light of how you're teaching us the biblical hermeneutics of interpretation, of interpretation and how to interpret the Bible. God, we pray that you would help us, give us wisdom, understanding, because, Lord, in Christ Jesus, I hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And because he dwells inside of us and he is the reservoir, he is the, the, the uh, place that we can run to, and you will lead us and guide us into all truth by your Holy Spirit. It's not man's attainment or, or degrees that causes intellect, but it's listening to your voice and understanding and getting knowledge from you and understanding you and learning from you, Lord. So, Lord, I pray that you be with everyone tonight as we go our separate ways and be with us till we meet again on Sunday. And, Lord, I just pray for traveling mercies that you surround everyone and protect them on their way home. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. God bless.